So with that, I am going to turn it over to Debbie to get started. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Mandisa, for joining us this week for our Summer Sessions uh, webinar series. I'm going to be brief with the introduction because I'm excited to hear your topic. Mandisa Thomas, a native of New York City, is the founder and president of Black Nonbelievers Incorporated. As the president of Black Nonbelievers Incorporated, she works to encourage more Blacks to come out and stand strong with their nonbelief in the face of such strong religious overtones. Mandisa has a number of media appearances to her credit, including CBS Sunday Morning, CNN.com, Playboy, The Humanist Magazine, and Jet Magazine. She currently serves on the boards for American Atheists and the American Humanist Association, and she was previously on the boards for Foundation Beyond Belief, the Secular Coalition for America, and the Reason Rally Coalition. In 2019, Mandisa was the recipient of the Secular Student Alliance's Backbone Award, and she was also named the Freedom from Religion Foundation's Freethought Heroine for 2019. Additionally, she was named the Unitarian Universalist Humanist Association's 2018 Person of the Year. That's a long list of service, and it's really good that your hard work is being recognized by so many different groups. So I'm really glad to have you here joining us tonight to talk about such an important topic, Women of Color Beyond Belief. Where do we go from here? So without further ado, Mandisa. Thank you very much, Debbie, and thank you, Samantha, for the warm welcome and the wonderful introduction. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I am here to talk about one of um, my now favorite, not just events, but also um, a, a, you know, a, an area of my activism, an area of my work in this movement that I take the most pride and joy in, which is working with and engaging with a vast number of people, um, and especially women of color in the secular movement. And, you know, we still are asked the questions about diversity and inclusion. How can we amplify, uh, you know, the voices of people of color? And, uh, you know, what can we do? And um, as someone who has been in this movement now going on 10 years and having connected with a number of women of color, including Debbie, who has been in this movement longer than I have, and also as I'm seeing a number come into this movement, um, this event that we held last year was an important culmination of years of work um, years of developing my organization, Black Nonbelievers, as well as engaging other organizations and other people and having the wonderful opportunity to have met in person um, a, a number of people who I didn't know uh, were very active before and that I think more people should know about. Um, and uh, it's also, um, you know, uh, it's also just a really, really good way to show that because there are still very few um, Black produced events in this movement. And so in doing that and in showcasing those voices, we also do it from, we also do it the way we we best know how and, and the, best, the, the best way that we see fit, which is um, the best part about having, you know, creative control and having, um, you know, production control over these events. So I'm going to get into, um, you know, a bit of a bit of history. You know, we had Chris Cameron last week, which was uh, a wonderful presentation, and it was very historic. And so this this um, you know this presentation is a, pretty much about recent history, you know, current times, and also looking into the future. So right now I'm going to share my screen here with you all. Um, hopefully everyone can see it. Um, so getting into about me a little bit, um, like Debbie said, I was born and raised in New York City. Um, I'm from Jamaica, Queens, for so all of my New York City representatives or people who are familiar with the area. And shout out to everyone who is uh, viewing this from our local affiliate there. Um, uh, like I said, you may have heard me say this before, I was pretty much raised non-religious. 
Um, I, my, my background was pretty secular. Uh, I was raised in what is uh, called, you know, what's called the Black Conscious of the Black Nationalist Community, in which there was a, a strict emphasis on Black history and awareness, cultural awareness and political awareness about, um, you know, systemic structures, systemic and institutional racism and such. Um, and so I uh, founded, started Black Nonbelievers in 2011. Uh, we've been going strong now for almost 10 years. And at the time that it was founded, I was working full time as the event services manager at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's headquarters campus in Atlanta. And so two years ago, I decided to take the leap to full time activism because it was where that was where it was determined that my time, work, and dedication was needed. And uh, it was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. Um, it's had its uh, challenges, but at the same time, I wouldn't trade it for anything because um, I, didn't, I didn't realize that I would be dedicating a huge portion of my life to this movement. But as I saw, um, you know, as, as I saw, the, as we continue to see the need for it, and as I realized how I was liberated by finding other atheists, black atheists in particular, other people of color, other women, other women of color, it continues to revitalize me every single time I engage with folks. And so if it, if it revitalizes me, I know it does the same for a lot of people. And this is one of the reasons why I enjoy conferences and conventions in particular because it really gives people an opportunity to engage in person. So, um, you know, if you know anything about Black Nonbelievers as an organization, we are very in-person event oriented uh, and we are very, um, you know, we have put on a number of events ourselves. Um, we have collaborated on uh, previous projects with other organizations. And these are just a few of our major events that, um, you know, that, that we have either put together or collaborated with over the years. And so the first one was the Reason Rally After Party in 2012, which featured Black Atheist rapper Graydon Square and uh, his Grand Unified Collective. Um, we had the, we co-produced the Blackout Secular Rally in New York City in 2013, along with the then active organization Black Atheists of America. Uh, we hosted our fifth anniversary celebration in 2016, which featured a number of, um, you know, number of speakers, number of folks that we've gotten to know over the years. And uh, also our cruise convention, now titled BNC Con from 2017 until the present. And so, like I said before, um, our our mission is driven by, um, you know, bringing people together, building up community, and and showcasing and amplifying, in particular, centering uh, the work of Black atheists, organizers, writers, leaders, etc., as well as other people of color and allies. And so, in 2018. Um, Sakivu Hutchison from Black Skeptics Los Angeles, whom I have gotten to know very well over the years, as well as a fellow uh, uh, board member and uh, BN organizer, Bridget Crutchfield, lovingly known as Bria. Uh, over the years, uh, you know, we have done our separate projects. Uh, we have also, um, you know, formed this working relationship with each other through some trials and tribulations. But, um, you know, we, uh, we really had a discussion about putting on an event that focused on women of color in the secular movement. And so with my background in events, putting on events, um, having been an events services manager in which my job was to make sure that they went off um, you know, without a hitch um, uh, most of the time. But uh, so that was my area of expertise. And anyone can tell you as an organizer and putting events together, it is really hard work. There are a number of people who may take this for granted. And I'll tell you that, you know, you like the finished product, you like the result, but there really is a lot of hard work that goes into it. And organizers often don't get the credit they deserve. 
Um, so it was presented by Black nonbelievers, Black Skeptics Los Angeles, and the Women's Leadership Project. It was a joint, uh, you know, joint production. Took place from October 4th through 16th, uh, for 6th, excuse me, that would have been too long, October 4th through the 6th of uh, 2019. So of course, this wasn't last weekend, but it was last year. And it was the first event ever to feature all women of color, atheists, humanists, free thinkers, skeptics, secularists, etc. And that's important for a number of reasons, uh, because usually at conferences, you see, um, you know, speakers of color, you may see about one or two at a time, maybe a few more, you know, I, I will uh, acknowledge that uh, organizations like American Atheists at their conventions has increased their number of, uh, of speakers and, and the diversities and the profiles. Um, but at most of your events, you still only see one or two. And, um, you know, as like I said before, having having connected with a number of women of color, whether it is online and uh, having the opportunity to have met so many in person, as well as develop, helping develop that leadership pipeline within my own organization, um, this, was, this event was well past its time to take place. So the impetus and the foundation for it starts, like I said before, in 2018. And it starts with the Humanist Magazine, the July, August, 2018 issue, uh, and uh, which featured the five fierce humanists, which was myself, Sakibu Hutchinson, Bridget Bria Crutchfield, Liz Ross, and Candace Gorham, some of you who may know very well, She's the author of the Ebony Exodus Project. Uh, we've had a long-standing working relationship with her, and uh, I'm actually going to read the uh, the the forward, the introduction to the article that was featured in the Humanist, which is still available online if you search it on their on the website. It's a well-known fact that Black women have served as the backbone of the Black Church since its inception. Black women raise funds for church buildings, evangelize for their churches around the world, and constituted the majority of members in denominations such as the African Methodist Episcopal Church. It should come as no surprise then that Black women have made the modern free thought movement possible. Among the most significant development in, these, in this movement over the past 30 years has been its institutionalization, and here, as always, Black women have played leading roles. Whether it has been the establishment of local groups like the Black Skeptics of Los Angeles, founded by Sakibu Hutchinson, or the creation of national organizations such as Black Nonbelievers, African American women have indelibly stamped their imprint on the free thought movement. They have pushed both Black and white free thinkers to broaden their conceptions of humanism and have shown that despite arguments to the contrary, feminism is not only compatible with humanism, but is also a central part of what it means to be a humanist. The Black women free thinkers featured here, as well as the thousands who aren't, continue push us to consider the central role of social justice activism in both our free thought activities and our daily lives. So I highly recommend uh, you reading the full article or you may be able to access a back issue from the humanist and uh, you may already still have a copy, a physical copy, and uh, it was a pleasure to, you see here two years ago, us on the cover, and you see all of us here as well on the, uh, on the other, in the other picture at the event itself. And so that, um, that was the, one of the foundations. And I will say once again, as we said before, this is the first ever type of cover story in its history where there were multiple black atheist women, women of color on the cover of any magazine, period. And so if you don't already have a copy of, of it, I highly recommend you get one. And, um, or, you know, you can just save this screen for prosperity. 
And so here also were some of the faces of some of the women, some of who are trans, some of who identified as queer and LG represent the LGBTQ community. Some you may be for you may be acquainted with or connected with on social media. And um, and you got an opportunity to see um, and hear their voices. And so there were a number of con a number of um, a uh, number of subjects that we touched on. And so there were a few, uh, there were some sponsors. If you had the program, uh, they were in it, but I'm gonna go through them as well. Uh, goals for the conference were to highlight the perspectives and the work of women of color in the community, to increase the visibility and opportunities for women of color in the secular community. One of the best things about conferences that I, and, and also appearances, is that it should foster more opportunities for those presenters, no matter who they are, but especially uh, people of color for future, uh, for future events and for future engagements, and also to encourage future support for us women, not just these women, us women, and the organizations that are facilitated by people of color, for example, BN, and also those who support people of color within their organizations. So as you see here, Debbie is the vice president of programming for the for American Atheists. And so um, while we also have, you know, black non-believers, there are some organizations that have people of color and women of color in their leadership. And so it is important if you can, as much as possible, to support as many of us as, you know, as, as you can. So some of the, before we uh, answer this question about will there be another one next year, some of the subjects, some of the topics that we uh, that we discussed at the conference, in addition to um, you know letting go of God and religion, which of course is a central piece to our you know our um, you know to our movement. We also discussed secular parenting, criminal criminal justice and reform, dem surviving domestic violence as a non-believer. Uh, we also discussed um, queer, uh, disabled um, sexuality, reproductive rights, um, end of life preparation. And so, so there were a number of um, topics that pertain in, you know, that were very relevant in particular to women of color, but that also um, impacted and also affect our movement in ways that we may not realize. And one of the things about me is that I don't revel myself in celebrity. You know, as much as I think it's great to have like big names at, you know, events, um, I really think it is important to showcase those people who have, those who have had their voices overshadowed and also those who have not been sufficiently recognized for their work and who people need to know exist, especially if you're in, they're in your local areas. And that was one of the best parts about this. And unfortunately in this movement, there is a deficiency in seeing the value of women of color as speakers and presenters um, and the work that we do you know, as opposed to some big name that can draw in crowds, which of course, you know, is it is good for fundraising. It is good for drawing people in. But if you're still asking yourself the question of how can we generate more people into this movement or how can we be more diverse and be more equitable? Um, this is, you know, these are things that should be considered. And um, we weren't just gonna sit around and wait for this to happen. Um, you know, we, we as a, as a, as a um, focused organization for people of color, and especially that amplifies the voices of women in particular, um, we took it upon ourselves to do it. And so um, some of our sponsors for this event uh, was the Freedom From Religion Foundation, uh, American Atheists, the American Humanist Association, Foundation Beyond Belief, 
compassion and choices, recovering from religion, and many, many others. And um, I, uh, we also, uh, California Free Thought Day, Atheist United, uh, Skepticon, and so there were a there were uh, a number of major organizations within the secular community and the Secular Coalition for America as well. Um, and that has been one of the best parts as well about cultivating relationships and building working connections within this movement, because um, it isn't just for me. It really is about um, you know being able to help people to understand that there are a number of people in this uh, in this movement that are doing sufficient work and that it needs to be supported. So will there be another one next year? Fingers crossed, uh, meaning this year? Yes, and uh, please don't mind, I meant to, you know, do, is 2020, definitely not 2019. So as of right now, of course, we are monitoring the current situation for COVID. And so we're hoping that, um, you know, we can host it in person. Right now, uh, it's still on, it's still set to take place in Chicago for September. We, of, of course, are monitoring the summer to make sure, you know, hopefully that, you know, the pandemic somewhat slows down a bit. But we are also aiming to, we will be making sure that we take all the safety precautions as much as possible. We're also taking into consideration that by now people will be uh, ready to attend an event in person, but that we are proceeding with caution and we advise everyone else to do so. So there will probably be video aspects to this conference this year. Can anyone attend? And this is a question that probably should need no answer, but um, I'm just gonna say it anyway, yes. But of course, a noted exception is anyone who tends to derail the conference focus, believer and non-believers alike. And this is important to note because whenever, um, whenever there is a spotlight on organizations for people of color and events that are facilitated by people of color, especially in particular by black organizations. Uh, we are often asked, well, you know, I'm white, can I attend? Or, you know, I, I'm white and I don't want the focus to be on me, but you just kind of made the focus, <laughs> you just kind of made yourself the focus, but, um, or can I attend? And so as an organization that is a 501c3, much like other organizations, Everyone is welcome to attend our events. It is just that there is a specific focus and we want everyone to know what it is. And the main purpose is to hopefully not just learn and hear, not just hear and hear the, the women and hear the speakers learn from them, but also uh, find out how you can further support their work. So can anyone attend? Absolutely. Do we still need support? Yes. Um, you can visit our websites at womenofcolorbeyondbelief.com or Black Nonbelievers to support the ongoing efforts of our organizations as well as um, our ability to keep this event going. Um, so in conclusion, um, it's gonna be sort of a short conclusion here. Um, we're seeing uh, no, a rise of so we're we're in a current we're we're in a we're in a new cycle of you know awareness. There are more. Okay, so thank you all very much again for hanging in there and bearing with us. Um, so we've went through we've gone through uh, the history of the conference and uh, you know where. So in conclusion. Um, we are now in a new cycle of awareness, especially as we are seeing um, in this in this current year of 2020, which has been odd to put it mildly, where we're still in the you know we're still in the midst of a pandemic. Um, we've been dealing with a longer pandemic of of violence against um, you know the black community, against people of color, and we're now seeing people that are very tired of it. 
And now you're hearing, and there is a new, there is a um, a new heightened sense of awareness and a willingness to be more aware of the work that um, Black activists and organizations are doing. Um, so some people have been, some of us have been doing this work for a number of years. We have been as an organization, we have uh, been sharing, we have been explaining uh, the you know, the challenges that black community faces in addition to religion, these systemic issues of racism and injustice and how that impacts our community and also how it affects us as a secular community. And also how women of color and women in particular are even more affected and more impacted by these systemic issues. And so, as we continue, the question was, where do we go from here? Um, as an organization that, um, you know, that has always amplified, again, amplified the work and the voices of Black folks in particular, and especially Black women. Um, and uh, as we have now put together this particular event, and it isn't the first of its kind as far as featuring all women. Um, I, ha I should have said that before. Uh, the Center for Inquiry re previously uh, hosted the Women in Secularism Conference. Uh, I know they were, were hosting that for a few years. Uh, one of our other partner organizations who was also a sponsor for this event, Secular Woman, uh, put together the Secular Women Work Conference uh, in 2015 and in 2018. So it isn't the first ever women's conference. And I'm not here to say that we have done something that no one has ever done, you know, in, in history. But as far as a conference that has featured all women of color, that I am proud to say that we have done. And so from here, if you can see, uh, it, this, this particular event was not just bringing uh, those, these women, uh, us women together. It was also about bringing a community together and also about um, sharing. It was about sharing the expertise of the th us three women. And as you can see, I'm wearing my, my staff shirt from the conference. Um, and these were, so these were the three points that we brought together for this event. Um, you know, the envision, the envisioning of this event, uh, which, you know, uh, which is best um, showcased and displayed by Sakibu Hutchinson, uh, who was very much as a writer, very much a, a visionary. Um, and I think we all have the envision. But my, ex my, my area of expertise is execution. Uh, it is in putting things together. It is trying to make sure they go well and that it is of high quality because as an organization, we like to, we like to incorporate style and substance. And I'm very, very proud of that. And the exuberance because everyone should be excited about, about seeing more women of color at events, more women of color as speakers, as writers, as activists, and as organizers. That is, uh, you know, that is something that is at this time very, very unparalleled. And as again, we continue to move into uh, the future, and as uh, you know, our voices and our, you know, our perspectives and the treatment you know, will not, our voices won't be silenced. You know, our, uh, the treatment that we have um, received over the years is not going without, you know, it, it is not going unspoken anymore. So, um, and it was for us, by us, especially as women to, you know, to put this forth in, again, in the, you know, in from, from our perspectives, which are very important because as we hold up movements, um, as we continue to be foundations and as women are, you know, continuously doing the work, it is well past the time that not only do we receive credit for it, but also that it turns into more working opportunities and more areas and more opportunities for sustaining support 
um, in a movement that really does um, need, uh, it really does need us. It really does. And so the best way to show that we are needed is to ultimately be supported. So uh, because in supporting us, helping us ultimately helps everyone in this movement um, tremendously. And so uh, from there, you know, I like to say thank you all for joining in. I hope I didn't cut into the Q&A part, but um, this will be the time for questions. And this was uh, a picture of all of the presenters, uh, most of them, and some of, our, some of the organizers. Uh, some, there are some voices, uh, some people that may be familiar to you. Um, and there's just something about, if you were there, and there were, there were a few people who were there. I know Debbie and, and Sam were there. There is something about, there's something magical that Black nonbelievers in particular brings to the table. If you have never been to one of our events or event that we have co-produced, um, I highly recommend you put it on your calendar because it is often like something, it is often like something you have never experienced before, um, especially in this movement. You know, we we incorporate, you know, education, information and, you know, the fun and camaraderie. It, it was just it was a phenomenal experience and we hope to bring it for years to come. So thank you all once again. And please do so visit the website and uh, continue to support not just the event, but also the organizations. So thank you. Thank you. I was there and it was the most fun <laughs> I'd had at a conference in a long time. So I'm looking forward to the future future events for reals. So I have a couple of questions before we move to the audience Q&A. Speaking of future events, you, uh, you listed some of the topics that the past conference covered ranging a lot of them were racial justice issues some of them social justice issues they were topics that are very relevant for black community organizers and activists and thinkers and people who are concerned about the state of the community and the kinds of forces that hold people back from a good life i guess it's a decent way to say that but we don't see a lot of those topics covered in broader atheist community events and conferences. Some of them are touched on, but sometimes are considered too controversial, too divisive, too niche, you know, like, or they don't have to do with religion as directly, right? Like the way that religion intersects with some of these topics, when we work in the black community, it seems very obvious because so much of it has to do with community support, um, resources, things like that. Um, do you think that when we talk about like relevance for the secular community and some are sometimes failures to reach people like communities of color, for example, and other groups, um, is broadening the topics that we cover one way that we could do that? Absolutely. Um, that is definitely something that we've been saying for a very long time. And oftentimes, and I, I know you've experienced this as well, you know, as, a, as an organizer um, in, this, in this movement, that, you know, it, it's considered mission drift or mission creep, or if it's something that may be too delicate or, you know, or offensive to, you know, uh, you know to, the, to the people that are there, you know, it's like, well, it's, it's there, there's a lot of, you know, intellectual prowess, which again, we like to pride ourselves on our ability to research and be skeptical and be critical. And how is this any different, especially as we are, you know, non-believers and as we approach things with a more evidence-based, um, as we approach things with the, you know, with, with, with uh, evidence and verification. There is evidence and there is a, you know, we, we can back up what we're saying, you know, with, with the evidence. And so when we're, you know, when we're going up against that ivory tower and, and we've, we've seen this from a number of people who are 
you know, privileged enough to either never have experienced these things personally, or they've actually, you know, they may have read some things, but they've never had to engage people in real time. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a discomfort, you know, for some, but guess what? Just as we are challenging the status quo with state church separation, with the, you know, the evangelical rights, this is also another way we also, we have to continue to, um, you know, work on ourselves as a community. You know, we're not homogenous. You know, there are issues that affect everyone differently. And we're going to speak to that. And if there are organizations that are putting on events that won't necessarily speak to it, then guess what? There are organizations who will. <laughs> and um, there, there are going to be people who will be more interested in, you know, in, in the you know, in attending and engaging those folks who are more on the ground and who are speaking to the issues that directly pertain to us. Because once we, you know, once we believe, and there are some people who are still struggling with, you know, with, with uh, leaving the, you know, God concept and leaving religion behind. And that's always going to be something that we support. Um, but as these other issues uh, pertain and as they affect our communities, th there's also time to moving forward. How do we work on those too? Yeah, good point. One thing that you brought up, which uh, made me think about the fact it's been commented on before. I wonder if it, it still looks like this to you is like how many women are in leadership positions in the black atheist community? And partly, as you said, like when we have had events and when we've had opportunities to showcase and highlight people, like the Women of Color Beyond Belief Conference is a perfect example of this. You highlighted organizers, you highlighted activists, you highlighted people who actually engage in these issues. You know, they weren't necessarily uh, celebrities if we define that as like people with high, I don't know, in atheism and YouTube channel counts or something like that, right? Like they're doing the work, as you said. And when I've seen events in the secular community that focused on, say, workshops, they never had any trouble. In fact, almost always, if it's workshop based, the majority of the presenters and speakers will be women. If it's, let's find people with PhDs and people with certain levels of status to speak, then they suddenly have a hard time finding diversity, you know, having women on the stage or younger people and things like that, because they've already sort of bound that in. So highlighting organizers, I think, is one of the ways that you've had no issue uh, finding women doing the work out there. Do you think that's a reflection of like the the way that women, black women, often have to have roles in the church? I know it's something for it women of uh, the women in secularism conferences you mentioned was a you know we had it was a different slice of people, but not as many organizers and activists I think as the women of color beyond belief. Go ahead, sorry. Well, the thing is that it isn't just uh, coming out of the church. Um, it's also um, indicative of what we deal with in society. Um, sure, there is a very um, religiously based stigma and burden that is put on women to do that work while not even recognizing, barely some barely even recognizing our humanity. Um, but that does go beyond, uh, for, for black women is definitely, um, present in the church. It, that seems to be expected, but it seems like for, and, and let's, let's, um, uh, let's acknowledge that, you know, American Atheist was started by Madeline Murray O'Hare, you know, a woman. And I know she caught a lot of, she caught a lot of flack. Uh, the Freedom From Religion Foundation was founded by women as well. You know, um, and Nicole Gaylor and her her daughter Annie Annie Laurie, one of the co-presidents. So women have always been at the foundation of of starting, uh, you know, and co-founding movements and and organizations. But it's often, you know, at, at times, you know, it seems that the you know the ones who are given the most credence and the ones who are given the most credibility tend to be, you know, the very academically, um, you know, the, the, ac you know, the, the very academic, you know, men in the movement and, and mostly white men as the, you know, as the most credible voices. And we know that isn't true. And for myself being a practitioner, 
for being someone who has engaged people directly. You know, I, I contend that the people on the ground doing the most work are the ones who deserve not just equal credit, but more, <laughs> because it takes work to get these people to these events. You know, it, take, it takes that practical knowledge and that expertise and that skill, because that's what, it is a skill you know, to, to put these, you know, to put these events together and to execute them almost flawlessly. And I say almost, <laughs> um, but um, I, I do think that it is the only, the church is only one part of, of that. And uh, that that's just, um, and, and having been raised in the conscious community, I can say having not been raised in the church, I've seen it there as well. Yeah, to that, I mean, I came from a, black Catholic background in the North, the Northeast, right? So it wasn't quite the same as a lot of people's experience when they think of, people sometimes assume this kind of monolithic black experience in America of, you know, family from the South, a certain kind of baptist -y church background, things like that. I think when we, like the first round of people that we saw in, the sort of grassrootsy black atheism. When I first became in charge of African Americans for Humanism in 2010, I met you, I connected with you in 2011. Yeah. Um, and we did the African Americans for Humanism billboard campaign, which I talked about a little last week with Chris Cameron, that was launched for Black History Month 2012. Um, so for that campaign, we pulled together eight people in seven different cities to be representatives on billboards for black humanism black non-religiousness. And I didn't realize this before, though I should have. I just did a tally while you were talking. Six of the eight were women. I did realize more when we started bringing people together and doing photos and prepping for the campaign and developing talking points that a high percentage of the people involved didn't come from the assumed like black church background. And I think that's changed over time too. I wondered, uh, maybe my perception of that is wrong, but several of us had Catholic backgrounds, several of us had West Indian backgrounds. You came from the conscious community. Sakibo, I think, was raised secular. And I think for that first round, some of the people that we saw being spokespeople, it's because they didn't have as much to lose stepping away from a church community. And so they were like, what the heck? Like, this is what I'm doing now. That's changed over the last 10 years, I think. And Candace's book, um, Ebony Exodus Project about women of color leaving religion was a big contribution to this too. But yeah, we're out there and I think we've, the, the fact that uh, we've always had a voice in this, there's been no shortage of us. <laughs> right. It's been it's very different, right? Chris Cameron's commented on it, Sakibu wrote about it in her book Moral Combat, that in black atheism, there's been no shortage of women in leadership positions at the local and national level. Right. And I think what we, we've seen, you know, we, we've seen some people come and go um, and uh, burnout is a very real thing in this in this community um, and also having to deal with and also having to deal with a number of people who continue to ask the same questions of us over and over again and they don't just ask it but when we give the answers and when we give you know when we provide solutions they're often either ignored or not supported and there's often still a disparity in that and um you know but but working through it has just been extremely important you know bn was only supposed to be local to atlanta you know, it was only, you know, it was, you know, when, when, when we first got started, you know, African Americans for Humanism was, you know, a, was around, uh, you had Black Atheists of America, you know, Black Skeptics, Los Angeles was around. And so um, there were, you know, different Black organiza atheist organizations that were, you know, each had their own specialty and also, you know, took on each, you know, ident identification you know, specifically, which I think is very important. And it also showed the diversity within the black community and that everyone's uh, journey to atheism, even within our demographic, isn't the same. And yes, I think it does take those of us who may have, have not necessarily had to escape religious indoctrination or, you know, extreme religious or fundamental religious indoctrination 
to kind of push that envelope because I certainly had people who have tried to discourage me from be, you know, expressing my atheist and secular identity. Even as, even though I've been, I was raised secular, you know, I didn't escape indoctrination. And this also uh, goes to, you know, this also speaks to the different issues that we face within the black community and also in other communities of color. So uh, I think that it's it's very important for people to understand that it isn't just one dimension, it isn't one dimensional. You know, it never has been, it never will be. And the only way people can see to understand, fully understand beyond that is to hear our different perspectives and to see the variety and the diversity in our work. To that, so you talked about the stigma and marginalization that Black atheists and particularly women can face. And as you know, <laughs> as a board member and whatnot, American Atheists led the Secular Survey Project and published the Reality Check Report in early May, mm -hmm. this pandemic. I'm just like, what month are we in? Early May, so almost two months ago now. And it showed that African-American participants were half as likely as others in, to respond to the survey to have supportive parents and three times as likely to have been physically assaulted. And there were a lot of other disparities. In fact, we'll be working on a special report focusing on African-Americans as the first, or Blacks and African-Americans as the first kind of breakout report from the survey data. So I'm excited that we'll be able to dig into more of that and look at some of the, the differences. Because yes, the Black community, as you've noted, is the most religious demographic in America. and there's a reason for that. And as a minority group that's marginalized in different ways, there's a reason why the church has such power and why people think that stepping away from the church is an attack on the black community. But you've had a lot of success with black non-believers since taking the lead and, and running with it, right? Can you talk some about the growth that you've seen with black non-believers? Like, have there been a lot more groups? Have they changed in their nature? They're providing this important service in the community on the ground in all these different cities, like where people need them. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so of course, as uh, like I just stated before, um, we were we were only supposed to be local to Atlanta <laughs> as a you know as, as a group there. But as we continue to engage the you know the secular community and also the community at large, um, we had the uh, good oper we had great opportunities to connect with some other folks in media and um, other organizers. Um, and other leaders. So um, since Atlanta, you know, since uh, 2011, we have, um, you know, we have expanded. We do have multiple affiliate groups across the United States. Uh, right now, we are at 13. Um, you know, and and also we we've been able to <clears throat> establish more of, you know, leadership you know, leadership positions, even though for all of us is still volunteer. We have, you know, it's been an opportunity for people to really get in and roll up their sleeves and start doing the work. Because uh, the one thing that I've always uh, maintained is, well, there are things that we need to do that we, we realize that there are things that need to be done there. We realize that things that are that need to be changed and ultimately it's gonna be us up to us to start it. And so as people, you know, have engaged us, we have uh, increased our number of affiliates, the number of organizers that we have within the organization. Um, I realize I probably just double talked that, but, um, and also uh, we've been able to, uh, you know, we, we've, you know, we've been featured in a number of, you know, media outlets. You know, I rarely say no to anything, which is probably not always a good thing, but, you know, any opportunity that is, you know, that we come across to uh, be interviewed or to have our voices featured and not just mine, you know, it is our voices. Uh, you know, I often, you know, I try to facilitate that as much as possible because that is important. Seeing us and hearing us and actually being out there for people to speak with us and work with us has been very important. And that is where I can say that my expertise as an organizer and, um, and, and putting things together really comes in handy because, you know, I don't just like to start things. I like to see them through. 
And that has been, a, a, you know, that has contributed significantly to the growth of the organization and the success of the organization. You know, of course, uh, and, and we are serving, you know, institutionally, we're, we're dealing with a number of factors here. We're, we're dealing with people who are, you know, leaving their religious beliefs behind, which which can be very, very polarizing. And systemically, you know, there are factors that are involved in that, which makes our work so much so much more important and like you said with the with the secular survey it basically backed up everything we've been saying all these years it basically said that you know what as a demographic it is much much harder to be visible and to you know to to um you know and, and to uh express your your atheism or your non-belief or your 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 um your criticism of religion within the community it basically told it basically told the story of you know of 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 the work we've been doing all all these all these years and so it's nice to finally have some qualified data on that which shows hey we're not just making this up <laughs> you know we we're we're not just making this up we're doing this for a reason but as in carrying on a tradition of resistance because the black community has always been, you know, resistant, you know, and resilient. And so this is no different, you know, when there has been a challenge, you know, and, and this is no different, you know, this, when, when we, when we're seeing this challenge of religion in the community and also in people needing support um, for leaving those beliefs behind, whether they're fully atheist or not, this is what we needed to do. And so, this is, you know, this is just, you know, we're just carrying it on. Yeah, speaking of carrying it on, my my last question before we get to the audience Q&A is like, we talked a little bit about how things have grown, the community, this, this newer Women of Color Beyond Belief event. Where would you like to see that go? Where do you think things can go? Well, as I continue to, um, you know, as I continue to travel and engage, and whether it's uh, in person or in social media, there are many more voices and people out there doing this work. So hopefully it will encourage more women of color to get involved in the community and, and in, uh, in, in activist work, um, whether it is with Black nonbelievers, whether it is with other organizations. And also, and it doesn't even have to be secular organizations because we've engaged and we've, we've connected with a number of atheists and non-believers that are in other organizations. And they actually probably didn't realize before, you know, the significance of organizing and, and convening with fellow non-believers because there is, you know, there's power in that. You know, there, there's power in being in a space where you don't have to justify yourself to anybody, <laughs> especially on the basis of your lack of religion and your, you know, your, your lack of belief in God. And so in um, hopefully we'll, we'll get more, you know, hopefully more people will be inspired and encouraged to get involved and stay involved and help maintain the organization receive the support that is needed one and uh and and give people that that strength and and that courage because it does take courage i mean for for me it was just something i saw as necessary so but for other people it does take courage and and for if if nothing else and there's always going to be voices is always going there's there there are many more women of color that we didn't get to feature last year and so there's always going to be more that we can hear from and hear from again, because as we've as we've been involved and as we've worked in this movement, our work evolves. And so our perspectives evolve. And so people will need to continue to hear them. And so it, we hope that it will be continuous and that, again, in sustaining that foundation and, and building it and it not just be something fly by night. Um, and and so I and I'm very very happy that for those of us who have stuck with it through thick and thin, and then at times it's been thick. Um, you know, just being able to you know keep the focus on where it's needed is a re this is a result of that. 
this is a result of maintaining and keeping the focus and realizing who we were who we're fighting for and who we're who we're trying to support and not just women this is just for everyone but particularly women so hopefully you know it will it will turn into a you know a, a much bigger event you know we, we're we're hoping to do this annually um uh and uh you know and continuing to you know present those opportunities and build up, you know, those opportunities and, and leadership uh, for, for more women in this movement. Yeah, it's amazing work you're doing. <laughs> this is an amazing event. So yeah, I hope to see many more of those. And I could ask more questions, but right. I before we get to the many many last though, time. I'm yeah. So before we get to the Q and A, sorry, um, I meant to tell folks that you can see um, video of the presentations from last year's event on the Black Nonbelievers YouTube channel. Uh, so you you can uh, you can visit there, and I'm happy to say that there were a number of photos from the U.S. Secular Survey from the Women of Color Beyond Belief Conference that y'all were able to utilize. So that's also another good thing that comes from these events is that when you when you begin to see the people, you know, you can, you know, they can be utilized for, you know, for, um, you know, for the work of, for other organizations too, which ultimately helps us. Our Indeed. excellent photographer, Josiah is tuned in. So excellent yeah. pictures. Hey, Josiah. Oh, Thank you, Josiah. <laughs> Uh, so we we do have some questions. A couple are um, related to the convention that I know the answer to, but I'm going to toss them in your direction anyway so that you can answer them, um, and then I'll drop the links in the chat. So the first one that we have is, if you decide to do it this year, will you have an online component so that people don't have to travel to it, or will you just postpone it entirely, or have you decided that yet? No, as I said during the presentation, um, there will more than likely definitely be an online component to this. Um, we will most likely be able to, you know, we will have that capability for people to view the speakers and, um, you know, online and uh, and stream it. We'll try to stream it as well. So, yes. Excellent. And then also, I know that during the presentation, you said, of course, you want men and people who are not people of color to come to these events. But somebody had a sort of expanding question on that of what can men do to support this movement and this event other than, you know, promote it and and uh, help fi financially. Is there other actions that they can directly do and take to help you um, sort of get this message out there? Yes. So um, in addition to supporting financially and attending the event and helping promote it, Liz, make sure you are not just listening, but understanding and taking in the information, um, adjusting your, if you, if, if we are expressing something that has affected women in particular, and you realize that you may be complicit in that, whether, you know, whether it was intentional or not, do take in that information and adjust your actions. You know, really, really reflect on it and, um, and, 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 and adjust, grow and learn from it. And if you see other people who are refusing to do the same, you call them on it. You know, you make sure that you are, you know, de, you know, you make sure you are properly defending the work that we do. It, it is a growing and educational process for everyone. And so, and, and we are presenting, you know, perspectives and experiences and work from, you know, from a lens that people may not have considered before. And so as we do that, you know, every, learning is, is something that we do every day. And so as we learn it, and uh, hopefully you're, you know, you're, you're taking it in, you're actually adjusting and modifying your actions uh, accordingly. That is, that is the best way. That's one of the best ways to um, continue to support what we do. Excellent. And then I have sort of more related questions about future events, um, the cruise, and also I don't think that you mentioned your 10th anniversary that is coming up. 
not yet because the, you know, the focus was women of color beyond belief, but you know, <laughs> but yes, we do have the 10th anniversary event taking place um, from January 15th through the 17th uh, in New Orleans. So wow. yes, you can, you may find that information on our website. You, it is open for registration. Uh, the cruise this year is going to be scaled back a bit, um, understandably, because of, you know, the current circumstances. However, right now it is still on. So if you are interested in attending, do let me know ASAP. Please get in touch with me ASAP so that, you know, we can make arrangements because uh, and I'm, I've, I've been closely following, you know, the um, updates and uh, cruises are expected to be sailing by October and the event is in November. So um, we're also working on an online component to that as well, where we may have some speakers that will be, um, you know, presenting uh, via you know, via Zoom or, and also we may have an opportunity for folks to, to view um, via web conference. So we're working on that as well. Excellent. And then we have, as you can imagine, a bunch of questions about current events and Black Lives Matter and the current protests that are going on. And um, at least three people commented about going to protests and how they all incorporate prayer and very Christian prayer, and they're trying to figure out a way to respectfully push against that, or if it's, in your opinion, appropriate to do that at that time, or how to get involved, um, and maybe put other viewpoints out there. Well, that's one of the best ways about engaging in person. Um, if you are, especially if it is a secular based organization or nonpartisan. Um, do volunteer yourself in in some sort of leadership because that's how things change. You know, it doesn't just change by, you know, you wanting it to change. If you are if you are involved in an organization that is either protesting or um, doing direct action as far as, you know, police brutality, you know, systemic racism and such. If it is starting with a prayer, please do, uh, you know, you know, do talk directly with the organizers. And also, if you have the time and availability, do, uh, you know, do get involved. Be not just to just not to just stop it, but to show that there is, you know, more representation and that there are other, because there are a lot of people who they're so conditioned to, you know, to their beliefs and, and that privilege that they probably haven't even considered it. And so sometimes it just, sometimes it just takes one person to, you know, get involved and say, hey, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we shouldn't start this with a prayer. Um, and I say, you know, and, and I do see that there are some faith-based institutions that are trying to co-opt the movement as they always do. <laughs> um, you know, I don't think we're ever going to, you know, hopefully as I think people are sort of seeing this tide of change and especially as more young people are doing away with religious beliefs and as they are actively involved in, in these movements, um, we, we will see those changes. And so, yes, direct action means directly getting involved. Showing up if you want to voice some the way things are run, huh? I'm okay. sorry. I said showing up if you want a voice in how things are run, huh? Go figure. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say the, the point you make too about the, the presence of young people in these groups and communities really does make it look different, even on the religious angle. For the, the racial justice groups that I've seen in different cities, that had a lot of people in their teens, 20s, early 30s, did not start meetings with prayer. They might have burned sage and set crystals out though, which I also found very annoying. <laughs> and was like, well, it's different, but you're banishing the bad spirits from this room. I, I don't like it. I'm not gonna say anything about it. It's a little different than, you know, the NAACP meetings or something that always started with like three prayers and had prayers in the middle and prayers at the end. But it does seem like the younger people, especially with the racial justice work, a lot of them are out as members of the LGBTQ community 
as he noted, sometimes that's the reason that people disconnect from the church. They're looking for other communities and things. The face of that is, is very different. Um, when we're looking at young people, it's, it, it makes me wonder what things are going to look like in, you know, 15 years or so, considering these, these changes, especially with the younger people. Right. And, um, you know, they're, they're still going, and, and, and I commend a lot of them for going against those traditions, because many young Black folks that I have talked to in spaces are still, you know, they're still in the closet with their non-belief from their parents. You know, it is still a very contentious situation. And, you know, so they're, they're fighting back against that, even though they know they may face consequences. And we always encourage people to be as, you know, to be as, um, you know, cautious about that as possible because we don't want anyone jeopardizing, you know, any form of support or livelihood for them, especially when there's support within our organizations where you don't have to be open or, or out, even though it, it helps a lot. But, um, you know, it, I think it might be helpful for organizations like the NAACP to be reminded that one of the principal founders was uh, was a, you know, I mean, for for education's sake, that W.E.B. Du Bois, who was a founder of the NAACP, was a free thinker. And some people may not know that due to the, you know, due to the ever presence of, you know, of religion in within that organization in particular. So it 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 shouldn't be used as well a point of reference to give people to something to think about because again they may it may not have even been considered but um you know yeah changing that narrative and also changing how things work or how things are done is extremely important and it's always been you know even during the civil rights movement you know you had student the student nonviolent coordinating committee that started um you know that, that started doing things a bit differently from the old guard but um you know it it's just uh you know it's just very very important to definitely not discount what the you know the younger people are doing and well as those who are of you know cuz we're what we're gen xers i think we're sort of in between but um you know for for us you know who who didn't have that voice before you know it is it is important for us to um to definitely recognize what you know what what all of us what many of us can bring to the table yeah and so that was a great segue into the next question <laughs> that i was going to ask um which is when it comes to building a pipeline so to speak of future movement leaders from obscurity into activism what are your thoughts on what needs to occur and that will help the movement that fuels the women of color beyond belief to continue on I'm sorry, can you repeat the first part of that yes, question? I think, I think what they're asking is how to move, get people involved in a way that builds them into future leaders. And I know that's something that all of the organizations struggle with. And so I'm sure that you have a, a particular take on it. Well, it is because, you know, we're, we're often asked, well, how can we, you know, bring more people of color? How can we bring in more young people? It doesn't work if you're only wanting them to, or wanting us to participate and nothing else ever changes. So if um, developing a leadership pipeline means that you are encouraging people to be a part of that process and you're actually taking them seriously. So if there are, you know, if there are not just suggestions, but if people are um, willing to do an area of the work that, you know, that is important, you know, then, then uh, you take them seriously. You, you take those suggestions seriously and you also take their willingness to be a part of it seriously. Because, you know, if we're just, if you're, if you're, um, if you're just hearing their perspectives and you're not really acting on them or you're not really doing anything or you're not encouraging them to, and not just saying, well, you do it, you actually work with them. People fail to realize that this is a team building effort. You know, we have to we have to continue to do things as a team and not just let the brunt of the work fall on a few people. 
and especially the few of us who are still not getting paid to do this work. So, or, or those who are getting paid, not getting paid what they should. <laughs> so uh, it's going to take team efforts and being a team means that you are listening to everyone and that making sure that everyone has a part in this. And that is the best way, you know, to, to move in any move, you know, to, to work in any movement. You know, it doesn't just, you know, you don't just expect people to get involved and just do just what you want them to do, especially not if you are wanting to, you know, if you're wanting to foster leadership beyond, because we're not going to be doing this forever. You know, and so we want to be able to do, put something in place so that this will continue, that there is, whether it's a training process, development process, and that we're working on it together, as opposed to just putting the responsibility on either a few people. Anything to add, Debbie? And this is <laughs> thumbs up, I agree. It's too often we see people want diversity. They want young people, they want women, they want people of color, but they want us as tokens and window dressing. They don't want to accept the fact that if you invite in people who have different experiences and expertise into to be part of your team or group, your group will be different too. And they want things to be exactly the same but just with more color present. No, things are going to be different if you change the constituency that makes that group, right? So what you said, yeah, it's 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 too often the case that if people of color or women or young people are invited in, it's to like stand over there and, and look like you're part of it without people actually being given any power or ability to change things and others not listening to them. So yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's like, it's a big freaking deal for like, why we haven't seen things change and we see people get burned out really easily, even if they've gotten invited into some, some spaces because they get blocked to, in their ability to make change. That's my addition. Go ahead, you can do the next question. <laughs> I'm not going to go into rant mode on that. Mantisa can rant for me. No, it's okay. Like, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> you say it. I concur. Yeah, yeah 100%. So here's one, that, here's one that came in. Um, <laughs> kind of funny. Okay, so have you seen Sean King's page recently relating to moving towards eliminating imagery of white Jesus in churches? I'd love to see more education regarding not only the imagery problems, but the overall restriction that religion places on society. I was tempted to tag Mandisa, but knew better on those posts, as I think she could enlighten so many on the history of non-belief in the Black community. Yeah, so I will say that I, um, a few of us have our issues with Sean King. Um, there have been issues with speaking of someone who has taken advantage of the voices of women. Um, Sean King has been um, one who has done that. Um, we, and, and I know a, a few of us have seen uh, folks throughout the years, you know, critique of religion is nothing new to the black community. I will say that. Critique of especially white Jesus and Christianity. It is nothing new. And as we, you know, as we see people who are attacking, you know, the symbols of oppression, we, we certainly agree that, you know, Christianity is definitely one of them. But Christianity isn't just a symbol. It has become, it has been the root and it has been insti so institutional that it is so embedded in people's minds that the imagery is um, only one aspect. Um, and that is, uh, it, it's a crucial point, but I've also read where it's like, well, it's only the white imagery that needs to go away. And it's more than just the imagery that needs to go away. Uh, Christianity has been white supremacy. It had, and particularly in this country. And it's more than just imagery that needs to go away. And so, um, you know, really dissecting it at its root 
is going to be important um, because because it is so ingrained into people's you know way of life that that is going to be a harder that is going to be a more challenging task for us and for as a community and with that um, I'm going to be we're going to be um, hosting an event that will in next month that we will be promoting very shortly where we where we discuss Christianity as white supremacy and at its root, not just the symbolism. I'm jotting that down to get the link so I can send it out in the follow up email. Um, I have one more question and then it's probably time to wrap up. And this is from Frank in Illinois, Anderson. And he says, should black non-believers start running for political office to help with change in the community? And have you ever thought about running for office, Mandisa? Um, so do I think black non-believers as individuals, sh uh, should they run for office? Um, absolutely. Now, as a 501c3 organization, you know, we walk a line regarding politics. And we encourage people to get involved in any way, as, you know, as, as many ways as possible. There's more than one way to do that. Um, I don't consider myself a politician. You know, I mean, I, I appreciate that I can convey a message that is well received by people on the front end. But um, my heart and my core is in engaging the people and, and doing the work that you know that now could that change? Maybe. But um, as far as an organization, um, you know, we we encourage as many people we have connected with um, atheists and black atheists who have run for office. Of course, we cannot endorse candidates, but we encourage people to get involved in that process. If you can run for whether it's local office or state office, if you have the ability to do that, then then do so. Because, yeah, it's going to take for people to get more uh, politically involved in that way. And if you are able to do so openly as a non-believer, then, then by all means do that. You do have the support of a community behind you in that. Um, so, yes, I think that more people, if, they, if it's within their capability, should absolutely should do that. Excellent. That was a good tie-in to the other uh, speakers we've had talking about other political issues. So perfect. So with that, um, we have gotten through most of the questions this evening and we have a lot of really great positive feedback coming in on the chat. I know you can't see Thank it. Thank you so much. And I will, I will sorry send about them along here. here. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to the best of us. And I'm also putting, um, people are saying, where can I find you? Where can I support you? I've dropped into the chat, um, Mindy says Twitter for both herself and Black Nonbelievers, her Instagram as well. And then of course you can support her on Patreon where she puts out posts that are sometimes inappropriate and almost always have musical references. So- <laughs> I learned a lot from those <laughs> about music. <laughs> then that means that they're, they're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so go on over there and, um, and and show her some support. And of course, we are looking forward to, I did also drop the 10th anniversary link into the chat for you all. And then of course, this will be recorded or is recorded. And tomorrow evening, a follow-up email will go out to everybody who's registered with the link to the recording. And also a bunch of these other links that we've mentioned in case you missed them in the chat will be in that email as well. Um, and then stay tuned for our speakers the next few weeks. We have, uh, who we have next? Jay Wexler next week. And we have Jennifer Driver, who is um, the policy person for SECUS, talking about sex ed on July 8th. And then we'll have somebody joining us from Compassion and Choices, talking about medical aid and dying on the 15th. And so we still have a bunch more great speakers to come. And we have had such a good time with everybody who's come so far. And so Mandisa, I just want to thank you again. That was a really great program. Uh, we got a lot of great feedback. I'll send you some of the really fun comments. That's 
part of what I do. I'm the follow-up awesome. email to you. Yes, thank you all <laughs> so much for for joining me. It's always a pleasure, you know, to to speak with the audience and talk about the work that we do, and uh, because it's important. So, and I really appreciate seeing everyone who I've engaged, you know, personally as well, because that that's one of the more satisfying uh, aspects of of uh, you know of this work. So, thank you all. Yeah, it's great to hear about all of this. Thank you. Have a good night.